name's Bob Kaler. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, we've been in the midst of a series in the epistle of James. And that's where we want to land this morning. We're on to James chapter 3. So I invite you to find your Bibles there. They're in the seats, uh, underneath the seats in front of you or behind you or the seat you're sitting on. And uh, turn them to James chapter 3. James is in the New Testament. We've been diving through here one of the major themes, and we hit one today on taming the tongue. So hear what James has to say here. My brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers because we know that we teachers will be judged more strictly. We all make mistakes often, but those who don't make mistakes with their words have reached full maturity. Like a bridled horse, they can control themselves entirely. When we bridle horses and put bits in their mouths to lead them wherever we want, we can control their whole bodies. Consider ships. They are so large that strong winds are needed to drive them. But pilots direct their ships wherever they want with a little rudder. In the same way, even though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts wildly. Think about this. A small flame can set a whole forest on fire. The tongue is a small flame of fire, a world of evil at work in us. It contaminates our entire lives. Because of it, the circle of life is set on fire. The tongue itself is set on fire by the flames of hell. You can tell James is, is being pretty serious here. People can tame and already have tamed every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish. No one can tame the tongue, though. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we both bless the Lord and Father and curse human beings made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, it just shouldn't be this way. Both fresh water and salt water don't come from the same spring, do they? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree produce olives? Can a grapevine produce figs? Of course not. And fresh water doesn't flow from, from a salt water spring either. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful for this marvelous morning. We're grateful for all the children and for a great week of Vacation Bible School and and uh, one of the reasons we have it is so that we can dive deeper into your word. And so we pray this morning, as we dive deep into this word, that you would speak to us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so here's a question for you this morning. Have you ever said something that you immediately regretted? Anyone? And uh, have you, did you attempt to take it back? Do you ever try to do that? Oh, I, I take it back. There is no taking it back, right? Once it's out there, it's out there. Unless, of course, you're using Twitter. How many of you are Twitter users? Wow. Okay, there was one in the last service. There are like four in this service. I am a Twitter user. Um, Twitter is the social media platform. How many of you use Facebook? Okay, a lot more hands on there. Okay, so, so it's the same principle that applies, except for Twitter only gives you 280 characters. It used to be 140 characters. I thought it was better at 140 characters, but now it's 280 characters to express your thought in an instantaneous way. And people on Facebook can go a lot longer with that. And, and Twitter, if, even if you don't know much about it, you know about it from our media, right? Because our president loves Twitter for good or ill. Used to be you could find out what was on the president's mind at a news conference or a speech. Now, just open Twitter. It's there every day, whether you want it or not. The result of Twitter and social media is that it often plays into this idea that we can run at the mouth immediately in response to something that we read or see or experience. And that means that our fingers often engage faster than our brains. Ever have that happen? You know, where you're like, I'm going to type this thing really fast, this really quick response, or you get an email. I think email is the spawn of Satan. Uh, but um, uh, we, we use it Life was so much easier when it was like, I'm just not available, right? So now I'm available all the time. And we read the email and, and we want to respond right away. And the result is often faux pas that is very public, right? We, we put stuff out there. If you're quick, though, you can, you can take it back. You can delete it. But someone's always watching. And if someone is watching quickly, they can capture what you said and bring it back to you later because the internet is forever. 
That is today's learning point. Internet is forever. James didn't have internet at the time, but if he did, he would certainly have had an entire chapter on how we control our fingers as well as our tongue. Our efforts to delete things notwithstanding, we're often proing, prone to saying things without thinking about them first, whether online or in person. And so in this section of the letter, James dives into a theme he's introduced earlier. If you remember back to chapter 1, we heard this in chapter 1, verse 19. James said that we should be quick to, quick to listen. You've got the Bible in front of you. Listen. Uh, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Verse 126, if any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive themselves, their religion is worthless. So for James, controlling what we say is a major part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And it's important for James because, like us, the first century Christians were living in a very tense time. Back in the late first century, the Roman world was going through an economic downturn. We know what that's like. We know there was a lot of infighting amongst various factions of people, particularly there in Israel, where there were Jews who were sort of getting ready to revolt. And in 66 AD, they did. And eventually, and by 70, Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is burned to the ground. And it's difficult in that world, that constant world of churning and, and bad news all the time, it's difficult to know what to say. And so James wants to give this group of people, these Jewish Christians in the dispersion, an idea of how they should control their tongues so as not to make the situation worse. Like their ancestors in exile, Christians need to learn to live like aliens in a foreign land. So how do we do that? Well, one of James' primary concerns of course, is around the issue of words. They're volatile, and in a difficult environment, it's potentially deadly. Chapter 3, verse 6, the tongue is a small flame of fire, a world of evil at work in us. The wrong word, even a small word in the wrong situation, can create an uncontrollable blaze that can engulf an entire community. I was reading uh, a couple weeks ago, about a lawsuit that's been brought against the Durango Silverton Railway Company because as they were running their trains a couple summers ago, a uh, spark, because they used the old coal-fired engine, a spark from the engine set the fire. Now they're trying to, to do a lawsuit that they need to pay a quarter of a million dollars to help with the repairs. And, and it's reminded me of the fact that, that this was not malicious or intentional. It's just something that happened. A stray spark set off a major blaze. And the same thing can happen. Even with our innocent trying to say something, we can burn things down. So James begins this section by warning those who use words the most, and those would be teachers. Teachers in churches, preachers, teachers who teach at home, all kinds of things about how we use our words, because words have potential to cause problems that lead to error. Chapter 3, verse 1. Teachers will be judged with greater strictness. Awesome. What teachers, when teachers use bad grammar or they misspell or they do something like that, they reveal their incompetence. I, I was reading about a tweet that uh, took place a couple years ago where the D U.S. Department of Education, the United States Department of Education, tweeted out about Webb Dubois, W E B Dubois, you know, the writer and activist. Well, they spelled his name wrong in the tweet. And then they issued an apology tweet in which they spelled the word apology wrong. These are teachers. They'll be judged more harshly. Of course, mistakes happen. James acknowledges this in verse 2. We all make mistakes often. Ideally, we should speak with precision. When our words are sound, James says, then our whole body comes into line. And he uses the image of a horse how you can control a horse with a bit and bridle, or how you can steer a very large ship with a very small rudder. That word sets direction. Amen. Right down here in front. I got it. On the other hand, if those controlling mechanisms are out of whack or they're used incorrectly, they can lead to a destructive destination. Look at verse 5. 
James may be referring to rumors here when he says, a small flame can set a forest on fire. Ever been subject of rumors before? Ever been in an organization where rumors run rampant all the time? It causes no small amount of chaos. A misplaced word by the tongue can incite an individual or the whole body to violence, despair, or fear. Verse 6, James says, It can contaminate our entire lives and set on fire the circle of life. I, I don't like that transition or that translation. It's too Lion King, the circle of life. You know, but what he really means is here it can spread to every part of our human existence. A bad word can make a ripple effect all across the culture. This is the kind of stuff, James says, that's sparked by hell itself. And the word there he used is Gehenna, which refers to a valley outside of Jerusalem, which was the garbage dump. And people would dump, it got outside the dung gate, to give you an example, and people would dump all kinds of garbage in there, and it would smolder all the time. That's the image that Jesus uses for hell, Gehenna, a lot of the time as well. It's a garbage dump. And so we shouldn't be seeing these things come from the garbage dump. Rather, we need to, to get our speech under control. In fact, in verses 7 and 8, James says, when our speech is out of control, it can upset the entire created order. And he refers back to the creation story, to the human vocation we've been talking about. What was that vocation? To be stewards of God's creation. And James says in verse 7 that, that you know, we've learned how to control animals and fish and reptiles, but no one, he says, can tame the tongue. It's full of deadly poison. Now that's an interesting choice of words. I think what James is doing here is taking us back to Genesis chapter 3. Because the re human sin was largely re the result of misplaced words and half-truth. The snake comes along and he's the first to speak. And what does he say? Did God really say? He used words in the wrong way. And that set a blaze, the situation we find ourselves in as human beings. Out of the same mouth, James says, come blessing and cursing. We bless the Lord one minute, and in the next we curse another fellow human being made in God's image. We speak with a forked tongue, two different directions, just like the snake. Indeed, we begin to think like snakes. In fact, science tells us that part of our brain is a reptilian part of our brain. That's the part of our brain that's all about fight or flight. And we tap into that, that reptilian part of our brain when we are instantly desiring to respond to something. We want to attack. We want to move forward. We want to ready, fire, aim when we do that. But when we become like the snake, that's one of the reasons that we speak or tweet without thinking about the implications of our words. We just want to get them out there. We want to, we want to go into attack mode. But verse 10, James says, my brothers and sisters, it just shouldn't be this way. Instead, James says, we need to pay attention to the source of our words, to consider our internal thought processes, to move from the reptilian part of the brain to the thinking part of the brain. Verse 11, if a spring is full of fresh water, it won't pump out nasty liquid. A fig tree doesn't produce olives, nor a grapevine figs. You can't get fresh water from salt water. Everything goes after its kind. And James implies that our words are the product of what's going on inside of us. Jesus talks about this when he talks about bearing much fruit. Fruit is the result of cultivation, the result of good things. Good things produce good fruit. Bad things produce bad fruit. If we are controlled by the reptilian brain that our speech, our tweets, become caustic because they're always reactive. But the wise and understanding person demonstrates righteousness. Okay, here we go. What is the definition of righteousness? Two staff people said it. That's not fair. <laughs> but but, but, I, but I, will give you, I will give you your treat anyway. <laughs> See, you missed out because you didn't write this down. What is righteousness? Being conformed to the image of God. That's right. That's right. Okay, if, you, if, you, if I didn't hear you, you can get your candy later. Remember, be honest. 
be honest, right? That's what this is about, to be conformed to the image of God. When our words emerge from a humble lifestyle that comes from wisdom, he says in verse 13, the kind of wisdom, James says in verse 17, that comes from above. So how do we prime the pump for that kind of wisdom? How can we learn to tame our tongues to speak in ways that edify instead of sparking dissension and destruction? Well, James asks us to consider how we think before we speak, how we cultivate lives that are fertile. And as disciples of Jesus, that becomes important for us because we need to set the example for the rest of the world, to speak in a way that is controlled and that emerges from the deep well of God's wisdom. In other words, to engage the brain and the spirit before engaging the tongue. Too often we get sucked into all kinds of other arguments and things like that that are not helpful in the long run. We get sucked into speaking the same way the rest of the world does. And I know this because I see your Facebook posts. Uh, you know, we, we've got to be careful about how we communicate and how we speak. A recent book by Baylor professor, where's... Uh, Ashlyn, Baylor professor, Alan Jacobs. Do you have Alan Jacobs for any of your classes? Alan Jacobs uh, has written some good stuff. And uh, we actually used this book in our book club this past week. The title of the book is How to Think, A Survival Guide for a World at Odds. And so when we think about uh, what we speak, when that outrageous tweet comes on or that crazy soundbite happens, we, we think to ourselves, what was that person thinking when they said that, right? The chances are they weren't thinking at all. They were reacting. Jacob suggests that we learn how to think before we speak. And in his book, he offers a thinking person's checklist, which is 12 items that I've summarized into three for brevity's sake today. So I want to give these to you. I encourage you to write them down because I think this will be helpful. Post them up somewhere, write them on your hand, put them on your keyboard, uh, put them on the back of your phone somewhere so that when you're tempted to say or type something, to think about these three things before you do so. In this way, you will move toward righteousness, which is being conformed to the image of God. Okay, so here's the first one. The first one is be slow. Be slow. In a world of instant messaging, it's tempting to react quickly. But snakes react quickly. Animals react quickly because they don't have the cognitive function. Jacob suggests that when we are tempted to respond, when we get that nasty email, when we see that ludicrous tweet, when we see that nutty Facebook post, the first thing we should do is nothing. Nothing. He says, wait five minutes, maybe longer. Get up out of the chair, walk around a little bit, maybe make dinner, maybe take some time to do some deep breathing to get the whole body involved because when the body is moving, the brain has time to process. Here again, you do not have to have an opinion on everything. You do not need to respond to everything. Silence is golden. We think about formulating an instant response, but it's often best not to respond at all. Does this really deserve my response? Will I somehow, when I bang out this incredibly insightful thing in five minutes, Will that change this person's mind? How many of you have ever had your mind changed by something somebody posted on Facebook? You said, I've been wondering about this my whole life. Now, now I've completely changed my worldview. How many? Zero. Zero. Right? It doesn't work that way. Good and wise thinkers focus on thinking and responding about the right things, not about everything. Chapter 1, verse 19, here again, remember what James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for your anger doesn't produce God's righteousness, which is being conformed to the image of God. Live it, learn it, know it. Go slow, be slow. 
Slow down. Think before you speak. The second one is to be teachable. Jacob says that one of the reasons we are quick to respond, especially on social media, is that we know others are watching and we want to impress our like-minded friend group. See, usually when we post something that, that somebody's talked about that we find controversial or we don't agree with, when we post our screed against it, we're not posting to try to convince that person. Back in the back of our minds, we're posting so that our friends will give us likes. Cal Newport in his book, Digital Minimalism, which we looked at over, over uh, uh, the Lenten season, talks about this. He says that, that in a, a culture of like, our likes on our Facebook posts and things like that become like a, a, a social slot machine, that, that we're always looking for more. And so when we post that, that really like gotcha kind of post, we're looking for likes that we will get that will make us feel good and that will impress our friend group. That's not what this is about, though. We see that other group then more and more as the repugnant cultural other, he calls them. And our speech becomes caustic, and the more caustic it becomes, the more likes we get from people on our side. The truth is, however, that we can learn from other people, even those with whom we disagree. It is possible, believe it or not. The key is in choosing good conversation partners to choose people with whom you disagree, but yet who are winsome and who want to have a good conversation, who want to learn. Too often, we engage with people who don't want to learn or we're not teachable ourselves, right? We, we, want, to, we want to be able to, to tell someone the, the truth, but we don't want to listen to their side of the story. We become one-sided and directed. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, do not cast your pearls before swine, lest they take them and trample them and turn and attack you. Or as an old senior pastor of mine said, don't wrestle with pigs, because you'll both get dirty, but the pig likes it. Right? You, you've got to think about who you're engaging with. Seek out the best and fairest-minded people with whom you disagree. Sit down and have a conversation. I see people post stuff on social media about something I'm involved in, and they're very caustic about it. And I will, I will message them privately offline and say, you know, if you really want to have a conversation about that thing, I'd, I'd, invite you to, I'd invite you to come and have coffee with me, and we'll talk about it. That usually puts the pin back in the grenade in a big hurry, you know? Because it's so easy for us to post something or, well, this is interesting. Let's, let's copy this thing and throw it out there. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Let's just get it out there because I'm going to get more likes by doing that. No, be teachable. Learn. Walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Because here's the thing. We are often wrong. Anyone? Do, do you recognize that sometimes you might, might, might be wrong? But maybe there's something you can learn. We build caricatures instead of using and assuming the best. We shouldn't characterize people as evil. Remember that we're wrong. We have to use our intellectual capital to value learning over debating, to listen, to learn, and to understand. Be slow, be teachable. And the last one is be honest. When you do speak, state what you think and believe with conviction but at the same time, draw from the well of God's wisdom and love. Look at verse 17. James describes this wisdom. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Now that is a good marker to lay next to what you're about to post. Is it pure, peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy? Does it assume the best? Is it fair? Is it genuine? When we speak out of that wisdom, James says in verse 18, we sow the seeds of justice by our peaceful acts. Or as it says in the Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. We can hold our convictions, and we should. But we hold them hold that position firmly while also 
making sure that we have a posture of compassion, a posture of learning, a posture of love toward those with whom we may have disagreement. You notice that Jesus never spoke at people, but with them. He got down in the dust with them. Compassion literally means to suffer with, to put yourself in another's shoes. We need to be honest about our own stuff, too. It's so easy to point out the faults of others, that political party, that side, those people, that thing, but to recognize that we've got our stuff, too. Humility is a big part of being a disciple of Jesus, leading to righteousness, which is being conformed to the image of God. That's what this is all about. Be slow, be teachable, be honest. John Wesley saw this as a major part of what it meant to be a Methodist. He actually wrote a sermon called The Cure of Evil Speaking because he saw that happening in the early Methodist movement. And he said this uh, in, in, in that sermon. He said, oh, all that, that you, oh, that all you who bear the reproach of Christ, who are in derision called Methodists. So remember, in derision, Methodists was originally an insult, were named after an insult. Would set an example to the Christian world, so-called at least in this one instance, put ye away evil speaking, tale bearing, whispering. Let none of them proceed out of your mouth. See that you speak evil of no man, of the absent, nothing but good. If you must be distinguished, whether you will, you will or no, let this be the distinguishing mark of a Methodist. He censures no man behind his back. By this fruit, you will know him. John Wesley was saying to the people called Methodists, you've got to be different than the rest of the world. You've got to speak the truth in love, speak it directly to think before you speak, to think and speak out of the great well of God's wisdom that has been granted to you. Remember what James says in chapter 1, if anyone who asks for wisdom will receive it. To speak well, to be slow, be teachable, and honest. This is helpful wisdom and advice in an age when good thinking and speaking are in short supply. James is eminently practical. And he reminds us again and again that words matter. So let us think clearly, whether it's with our mouths or our keyboards. I invite you to look at your speech this week. What are you putting out there in the world? Take a look at that chapter one verse or chapter three, verse 17 again, and ask yourself: Is it pure, peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy, fair, genuine? When we do that, we change the conversation. And when you change the conversation, you start to change the world. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this word from James. We thank you for its applicability, but we also are often shocked at what we say. I know I am. We speak without thinking. We react. Lord, help us to be more like you, to reflect your righteousness in the world. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.